you to turn to Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> We're going to the Sermon on the Mount, a new study in the Sermon on the Mount. And <clears throat> we're actually uh, going to be zeroing in on the next uh, weeks into uh, chapter 5, verse 21 through 26. It's going to be the focus of study. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through verse 26. Today we're doing an overall view of the passage, uh, which basically will be looking at the entirety of uh, chapter 5. And... <clears throat> Chapter uh, 5, verse 21 through, 20, uh, through 48, the end of the chapter, of course, is one section. And it's broken up into six sections, and we're going to be focusing in the next weeks on the first section itself. Uh, really would like to read the entire chapter, but uh, time-wise, that probably is not a good plan. So I want to just introduce verse 21, chapter 5, verse 21 to you, and verse 22, just those two verses. You have heard that it was said to them of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, Whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Uh, let's pray. Jesus, um, I remember the statement that you made through Paul about the foolishness of preaching and how foolish I am to stand here today and try to propose some kind of understanding to this passage. And the only shot we got is that you would come and speak to us yourself. And so, God, uh, I'm, I'm willing to sit in a chair. I'm willing to be spoken to. I'm willing for you to take over. I'm not here to tell anybody anything. We're all here to sit at your feet and say, Mighty Word of God, living Word, take your written Word and speak to us as we've never been spoken to before and draw us into a new intimacy and give us eyesight to see the possibility of what you really want to do in and through our lives. Uh, so we give ourselves to you today, uh, this word for that purpose, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, if you go to commentaries, you will discover there's a lot, some argument about the uh, shaping and the forming of the Sermon on the Mount. And there are a lot who think in terms of a compilation in other words, Jesus was speaking one day and said these few verses, and then another day he said these few verses, and over yonder he said another few verses. And a guy like Matthew came together at the end of all of this and kind of just accumulated it all together and put it in this form. Hey, it could be true, but it doesn't appear to be that way to me. In other words, when you're studying Matthew, you get the idea that Matthew is, bring, is having Jesus. He's coming down from the mount. He's called his disciples. He's gathered his disciples specifically to himself. He's looked them in the eye, and he says, Hey, I want to tell you what you're getting yourself into. And I want to give you the fundamentals, the manifesto, the very basis of what the kingdom of God is all about. So you'll know exactly what, I've been, what I'm calling you to and what you're stepping into and being aligned with. So from Matthew's view, the Sermon on the Mount is one flow and it's all tied together and one thing builds on another. So you can't just reach into verse 21 and grab a hold of it, pull it out and do what you want to do with it in chapter 5, verse 21 in this section because you have to see it in the logical, sensible, reasonable layout of what he's saying. And I want to just walk you through that briefly. You remember that in verse 3 down through verse 12, uh, he gives us the Beatitudes. And it's the opening statement, of course, of the Sermon on the Mount. And he starts out with the blessed thing. And you'll remember that the blessed thing is a congratulations. In other words, it's a whack on the back. Whoa, congratulations. Hey, you've made it. You're there. Woo, you're something. Hallelujah. Hall uh, and he congratulates you on achieving, arriving. And, of course, you immediately know that this is mind-boggling because there isn't any moral system, world religion moral system in the entire world 
that operates on that basis. See, all world moral systems operate on the basis you're here and you want to go here. Here is where holiness is. Here is where the real person that you want to be is. And here's where you are. And you work your way up to that. You discipline yourself. You come under the meditation. Read your Bible more. Come to church more. Give the preacher more money. And you work your way up to that. Now, it's a scale from 1 to 10, and probably I'm a 5, you're a 2, whatever. So we're working our way up to that. And I like to be a 5 and you a 2, that way I can look down on you. See, it's that kind of a system. And all the world moral systems operate that way. Jesus comes along, whacks you on the back, says, Hey, congratulations, you made it. You're there. And you, you're startled, you're, you're jolted. You say, well, how could that be? How could I just all of a sudden have arrived? And then he ties that in the first statement to, congratulations, you've arrived, and the reason is because you are poor in spirit. You're helpless. Again, it's the strongest Greek word for absolutely poverty-stricken. Not one single dime, begging poor, total destitution. So here you are, you're a loser, you're helpless, you're totally weak, you have no energy, no resource whatsoever. Congratulations! And you look at him and say, why are you congratulating me for arriving at the place of absolute helplessness? Because, he says, you are mourning over that, meaning you are embracing that. You are looking at that saying, oh, yes, I'm helpless. Oh, I embrace that. And you're not helpless because you sinned. You're helpless because, oh, you were made that way, God made you that way, and you're embracing the very essence of your own creation. And why is that? Why is he whacking you on the back saying, congratulations, you've recognized your helplessness, you're embracing that, and you're recognizing who you are? Because his overwhelming resource is coming, and he is literally embracing, merging, fusing, what's the proper word, infiltrating, saturating, uniting with you in that helplessness and in that uniting between his resource and your helplessness oh you've become the kingdom so the kingdom of god is not a location to go to the kingdom of god is a relationship to experience and congratulations you've arrived you're experiencing it. Why? Because you're helpless and you're mourning and embracing it. And out of that embrace, that new creature, see, the kingdom isn't me, the kingdom isn't God, the kingdom is us. And in that togetherness, in that intimacy, in that relationship of oneness between man and God, all of the resource of the nature of God begins to spill through the individual. Things like meekness, things like filling, things like mercy, things like Oh, purity, seeing God and purity, things like, uh, oh, victory and persecution, all that kind of stuff begins just to naturally flow through you that you've been looking for all the time. So the stuff you've been looking for up here is found down here because he has come and you have. So, whoa, congratulations, you're in. That's the formation of the kingdom. He starts with that. Now, the minute he gets done with that, you and I would begin to look at that and say, well, how does that, how does that function? How does that work in everyday life? Oh, he says, that's easy. It's relaxed. It's a non-trying thing. It's a, it's a rest in the lazy boy recliner stuff. It's a, come on, isn't this encouraging? This is not an uptight, strained attempt. This is a relaxed thing. Why? Because... Well, and he uses imagery like salt and light, which is verse 13 down through verse 16. Salt and light. See, salt doesn't strain to be salt, and it just is. Light doesn't strain to do light, it just does it. It isn't, I followed 12 steps of light, and now I'm light. It's just that I'm light. I can't help it. Why? Because it's who I am. So in this merging, in this kingdom thing, there is that which you are, which literally begins to flow into your world, which literally begins to happen. See, don't worry so much about doing the exact correct thing. Did I say the right thing? Did I go the right place? Oh, did I? Oh, 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 did I read enough? Oh, did I? See, don't get so tied up in that that you miss the relaxation of letting him flow in your life and create who you are. I suggested 
several years ago the idea of effortless Christianity and nearly got stoned out of the building uh, because we can't hardly stand that. Effortless Christianity. The Christianity in its essence form is effortless because it's a state of being. And in that in that intimacy, see, the only thing you really need to do is to go after him. Because how could you do anything anyhow? Because you're absolutely helpless. So in your helplessness, you're embraced by him. And in him, together, clinging to him, things begin to happen in your life. And the secret is all being wrapped up in him. And you and him together. So it begins to be salt and light. And again, salt is doing its salt thing. Which is not a doing thing at all. It's a being thing. And he says, if salt has lost its saltiness, how do you resalt salt? Well, you can't resalt salt because salt that isn't salty isn't salt. Right? I mean, if it isn't salty, it isn't salt. Well, how do you relight light? Well, if light isn't light, it isn't light. So you can't relight light because light isn't to be relit. It just isn't. So what I need is light, and what I need is salt, which is what I am in him. And that's the function in your world. So the function in your world is not a striving, trying. we got to get this done, not programming. It's not a day timer. It's the flow of his life. Then he comes to what actually is our section. And technically, our section that we're looking at uh, for the study purpose, is from verse 17 all the way down through verse 48. But we've already dealt with verse 17 through 20, which is the introduction. So we've divided this section into two sections. And this section overall is called the fulfillment of the kingdom. So, formation of the kingdom. Oh, I'm helpless. He's come in his overwhelming resource. And in that merging of his resource and my helplessness, poor in spirit, I've become the kingdom. And all of this stuff begins to flow through me. That appears to be in the imagery of salt and light in my world. That's how it seems to function. And as it functions like that, he says, let me tell you how and what is fulfilled in that. And this is the fulfillment of the kingdom. And he begins in verse 17 through 20 to give you an introduction to uh, this idea. And, when he give, and we've walked through that. And when he gives this introduction of the idea, then he moves to the application of this idea. And he gives you six illustrations of how this flows, of how this acts in real life. So there's no, oh, I don't understand in it, because he really nails it down in practicality. Now, the verse 17 through verse 20 which is the fulfillment of the kingdom acknowledged, is the introduction to this. Then our section is the fulfillment of the kingdom applied or application. Now in verse 17 down through 20, he says, Since you are helpless, his overwhelming resources come, and all of this nature of God is flowing through you, and uh, mercy, meekness, fullness, mercy, uh, purity, uh, seeing God, a uh, peacemaker, all that stuff is happening in you, and it's functioning in your world like salt and light, which is the state of being, then let me tell you that what I'm proposing to you is not a new idea. See, you may have thought that I have been, that I'm inventing something new because you say, oh, I've never heard that before. This was shocking to his crowd. So you may think that I'm proposing an addition to the scriptures. You've studied the law and the prophets. You've had the scribes and the Pharisees explain it all to you. You've got 613 oral traditions that you abide by. So you may think that what I'm proposing is kind of a, is a new religion. And I'm writing a new book. And I'm setting up a new strategy. And I'm uh, proposing a new religious ceremony and program. And I want to tell you that's not true. I did not come to destroy the scriptures. The law and the prophets did not come to destroy. In fact, he's so strong on that that in verse 17, you'll notice he said it twice. I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So what I'm doing is not adding to. What I'm doing is not complementing. 
what I'm doing is I'm taking you back to the scriptures themselves because you really messed it up. See, you really messed it up. And all these ideas you got, 613, you, you, you got clear off base. So what I want to do is take you back and reveal the scriptures to you again. And let me remind you, he says, what the scriptures are all about. Now get this, what the scriptures are all about. See, here's God in all of his nature. Here's the very core and nature of God. This is so important to the concept. Here's the whole, here's the whole nature of God. And God reached down inside of himself, grabbed a hold of his nature, took it out, and dumped it on the table of the world. And it ended up to be in written form. So you know what the scriptures are? They're the written form of the nature of God. And the scriptures, being the written form of the nature of God, are not academic study. It's not, oh, I'll study this like I'll study a law book. This is not a manual, an instruction manual to put my life together. This is not rules for proper living. This is, no, this is not a road map to heaven. That's not what this is. This is the nature of God exposed. The nature of God exposed. And then on top of that, get this, on top of that, the second member of the Trinity, who is God, set aside what he had as God, Never gave up being God, but set aside all the attributes that he had as God, everything that made him different than you. He set aside all that he had as God and literally leaped on the table and said, hey, nature of God exposed in the word of God, shape me. And the word of God, with its gigantic shaping fingers, reached out and formed the very life of Jesus and everything that dictated the Everything that influenced and dictated the life of Jesus was found in the scriptures. So the nature of God shaped Jesus, who then became the demonstration of the nature of God. So when you're looking at Jesus, you're looking at the nature of God, visible image of the invisible God. And when you're looking at Jesus, you're seeing the nature of God. And, you're, and when you look at the scriptures, you're reading about the nature of God, which shaped the nature of God in the person called Jesus. So when you're looking at Jesus, you're looking at the scriptures. When you're looking at the scriptures, scriptures you're looking at Jesus and you're seeing the nature of God whoa <laughs> isn't that phenomenal so this is not some ancient literature this is not some kind of rabbit's foot this is no this is the nature of God written word living word and oh by the way I forgot to tell you what and this is his impact what the nature of God in the written word did for Jesus It should do to you. Let it shape you. Let it form you. Which becomes then not some memorized scripture, not some proof texting stuff. It becomes the living, flowing person of God. The living word, the written word, the living word operating within you. But then that's what it's all about because you're absolutely helpless and you're being filled with his nature and his nature is producing meekness and, 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 and filling and mercy and, 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 and joy and, and peacemaking and all that stuff is coming out of you because of his nature. In fact, you're just being salt and light, which is his nature. In fact, you're literally the fulfillment of the nature of God in your world. So I look at you and say, Whew, I know what God's all about. And at the end of this introduction section, he comes to this verse 20. He says, I really want to nail this down for you. And he comes to this verse 20, which is the kickoff verse. And he says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You've got to be better than the Pharisee. <laughs> That's crazy. Because on the scale from 1 to 10, the Pharisee is at least at 8. I've never gone beyond a 5. I mean, come on. Thou shalt go to church. You, 
can't go any more than every time the church doors are open. That's what the Pharisees did. So how am I going to go beyond that? Oh, but you don't understand. See, you're back to the old thought process of, hey, I'm down here and I want to get up here and I work my... See, that thought process is gone. You've got to get rid of that. Get that out of your head. Don't think like that. Why? Because the kingdom isn't set up on that. We're not talking about and work here. We're not talking about that. We're talking about congratulations, you're there. And if that's true, could I have a righteousness that goes beyond the righteousness of the guys who work like dogs? Who are tempting? Who are slapping their hand and biting their lip and trying to work their way up? Could I have a righteousness that goes beyond anything they can produce? Especially when they're helpless like I am, so you know they're not getting anywhere. So if I'm absolutely helpless, then to think in terms of, whoa, the performance, I've got to get rid of that in my thinking. And I've got to come back to the, oh, the only shot I've got at this is a righteousness that's found in him, in the, my helplessness, his overwhelming resource. And now he says, let me show you what that kind of righteousness would look like. And he gives you six illustrations. Now he climaxes. This is going to be fun. He climaxes the six illustrations with the last verse. What is the last verse? Verse 48. And in the last verse he says, Therefore you shall be perfect. Woo! Uh, how's that working out for you? <laughs> and the minute the idea of perfection, which climaxes the whole deal, shows up, we just turn, well, we begin to look like you do. It's just, whoa, perfect? What are you talking about? Nobody's perfect. We've proven that, folks. Because we've showed you a mirror and you looked at your face and said, right, I'm not. So we all know that. We're not perfect. Nobody, but see, you're thinking wrong. Why? Because you're thinking in terms of here, and I want to arrive here, and here is perfect, and I'm working my, I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. It's two steps forward, one back. Whoop, two steps forward, one back. Whoop, I, I'm on my way, though. God's not done with me yet. And one day I'll arrive, he says, get that out of your thinking because we're not dealing with that. Why? Because you can't ever make that because you're helpless. And that the whole dynamic of the kingdom is what? Your helplessness, his overwhelming resource, and the merging of that. And the perfection is going to be found in the merging of your nature and his nature, your mind and his mind, your being and his being, into you becoming the kingdom. And that's where the perfect is going to be found. And the perfect is not a perfect in the sense of above mistakes. Because when you think of perfect, you think of no mistakes. And we're not even talking about that. perfect it's the greek word teleos which is means finished that which is reached its end term limit complete full wanting nothing that's the way i am yeah congratulations but i'm helpless i know but you've been filled with him and in his nature coming to be within you you are now in the position of filled Complete, finished, wow. Wanting nothing. That's your position. Now, to make it worse, he says, let me tell you the focus of this completion in you. And the focus of the perfect is not perfectly keeping my bank book. Many of you are headed to hell over that one. <laughs> Perfectly keeping my bank book. No. Not making any mistakes in my driving. 
No. No. No, no, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> we understand it. See, we're not talking about living without mistakes. Perfect doesn't have anything to do with mistakes. Well, what does perfect have to do with? Oh, he's very plain on that. See, you've got to come back to the Scripture. He's very plain on that. In fact, as he roars through these six illustrations, he comes up to this last section, which is all about motive. And as he talks about motive, well, look at verse, uh, go down to verse 45. Well, uh, stay with verse 48 first. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as. Oh, now we're setting the standard for the perfection. So if there's going to be perfection in my life, what's it going to be like? It's going to be just like your Father in heaven. <laughs> I'm going to be like God. Yes! But that's been the whole proposal, folks. See, the whole proposal is you're not here and you want to be up here and you're working like a dog to get there. No, that's not the proposal. The proposal is you're a helpless his overwhelming nature is supreme resource, and you and him have got together. So you are merged with the nature of God. And out of you is spilling all of this meekness, uh, fullness, fullness uh, mercy, uh, uh, seeing God, uh, purity, uh, uh, peacemaking. All of this is spilling out of you. It's like salt and light, salt and light in your world, so you don't have to produce it. It's just there, and you're living in that state. And what is state is that? It's the state of the nature of God filling you. So your perfection is going to be just like the nature of God. In fact, you'll remember the nature of God was dumped on the table of the world, ended up to be the Scriptures. Jesus leaped into the Scriptures and said, Shape me. So Jesus became the first man to be shaped by the nature of God and became the visible image of the invisible Father. That was who He is. That's who He is. First man in the kingdom. Now you're in the kingdom with Him, and that same nature is shaping you. And you're going to be perfect just like He was. Not living above mistakes, but perfect in as your father is perfect. Well, what do you mean? God is omnipresent. We're not talking about that. He's not mentioned that once. God is all uh, omniscient, all-knowing. He hasn't even mentioned that one single time. Not once has he mentioned that. Well, God is all omnipotent, all power. He's not mentioned power one single time in the entire passage. What has he mentioned? Love. The nature of God. Doesn't say you're going to duplicate the actions of God. You're going to be perfect as in the nature of God. In fact, he lays it out for you. Look at verse 45 now. He says that, the, that you may be sons, sons, man, sons of your Father in heaven. For how is the Father in heaven? He makes his son to, to rise he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. See, that amazes me. I'm sitting out in our house. Our, our, our yard is full of that stuff. Our, 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 our pavement, our, our driveway is over caked with all this. I can understand that happened to my next door neighbor. But you would think God would protect me. You don't seem to be surprised. Why? Because it rains on, snow comes on the, ice comes on the, God doesn't, oh, you, nope, nope, not you. Why? Because that's the way he is. He doesn't, oh, you're bad, I don't like you, oh, I love you. He's not like that. In fact, look at verse 46. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Don't even the worst people in your society, tax collectors, do the same? Well, I love you, yeah, you love me, but neither one of us like him. That's the way... The worst people in your world are. But not your father. In fact, he says it again. This is so strong. He says it again. If you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? 
Do not even the tax collectors, the worst people in your world, do the same? Yes. Oh, hi, 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 hi. Snub him. That's the way your world does. The worst people in your world do that. And when you operate on that basis, yeah, I greet you, but I don't greet you, then how are you any better than a tax collector, the worst people of your world? But your father isn't like that. And you aren't either. Why? Nature. Helplessness. His nature. You've come, and you are perfect in his nature. Just let it soak. Perfect in his nature. Well, how do I do that? Well, you can't. You're helpless. And get off of that. Because you can't do this. Why? Because that's the old work your way up. I get here. See, we're done with that. This is a new deal, people. This is a new deal of Jesus who died on a cross so the very nature of God could literally go to the depth of your inner being and could do something in you that is so dramatic and so phenomenal that through you all the nature of God becomes displayed. And the key element of the nature of God, he says, is love. Now he says, let me give you six illustrations of this. And let me, let me just run through them with you, and then we'll go back and go as far as we can with the time we have. He starts with murder, verse 21, and develops it. And as he develops it, it's hate and forgiveness, which takes you from verse 21 down through verse 26, which is the section we're really going to look at in the next days. He knew, secondly, to morality. Glad we're not doing that one first. Adultery and lust, which goes from verse 27 to 30. Then he goes to marriage, which is divorce and concern, which is Matthew 5, 31 through 32. Then he goes down to morals, which is the idea of swearing and honesty, your integrity, which is verse 33 through 37. Then he goes to revenge and forgiveness, which is verse 38 down through verse 42. Then he gives hate and love, which is verse 43 through 48, and gives you six illustrations. Now, Here's the interesting thing and what I want to tell you today. When you look at these six illustrations, he's doing two things. It's not complicated. He's doing two things. He's taking the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees and he's driving it, back, driving them back to the word, the scriptures, and in doing that, he does two things to it. He internalizes it and intensifies it. He makes it worse than what it was in their minds. And he makes it an inside thing instead of an outside thing. And he does it in all six of these areas. And the interesting thing about these areas is that when you walk yourself through these areas, you are hard-pressed to find an area that isn't included, a section of your life that isn't included, an aspect of your living that isn't found in one of those six areas. So he covers all of life, intensifies, internalizes. Let's just walk through a couple of them. Take the first one, verse 21. You have heard it was said of them of old, you shall not murder. Murder. What is he going to do with it? He moves you to verse 22. I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. What's he done? Two things intensified it, made it worse than it was. You shall not murder. Oh, I might pull that off. Because that's a physical act 
outside deal and I've got ways of compensating and handling my inside desire to kill you. I built a special thing in my basement, padded it well. I put your picture on the wall. I get a shotgun and I blow your stinking head off. And it helps me. I bought this big punching bag and I had an artist draw your face on it. And I just, whoa, and it helps me physically. I lose weight. It's really a good program, and I feel better after I've smashed your face in. So I basically meet this commandment. Now he says, let's take that outside, you shall not murder, and let's drive it inside. Let's internalize it, and let's intensify it, and make it worse than it was. Well, what's that going to look like? <gasps> you can't hate. Now, note this. He's not saying Hate is the seed of murder. And if you hate, you will end up murdering. So you must not hate because hate will bring you to murder. He's not saying that. He's saying murder is the outside physical deal. Hate is murder in the spiritual realm. So I might as well get a gun and blow your stinking head off. Just kidding. Because in literally, in the spiritual realm, I have hated. In fact, he goes on, and this is really going to be fun to get into. You may want to, I want to come. This is really going to be fun. Because he goes on and says, whoever is angry. Whoever says raka, which literally means empty-headed. Whoever says you fool, which means stupid idiot. Well, I know a lot of people that are going to hell over at, talking to me. <laughs> See, it really gets close, doesn't it? Because all of those are attitudes that are coming from inside. And they're giving expression of the way I feel about you. So what's the issue in the passage? Murder is about how I feel about you. Hate, stupid, uh, empty-headed, stupid fool. All of that's about how I feel about you. So the issue is not what I did physically. The issue, he says, in the, is in the spiritual realm and how I feel about you. How do you feel about me? See, how you feel about me is not my problem. It's your problem. And how I feel about you is not your problem. Well, you know what they did. That's not the problem. Doesn't matter what they did. Well, you know how they act. Doesn't that, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. You know how they treat me. Doesn't matter. See, how I feel about you is not your problem. How I feel about you is my problem. In fact, it's worse than that because it's his problem. Are you getting this? See, I'm helpless, man. I'm helpless. What's that mean? Oh, I embrace it. I mourn over it. He comes in his overwhelming resource, his nature, and literally, oh, and I'm embracing his nature, and I have the mind of Christ, and I have the nature of God flowing in my system. In fact, I am the kingdom. Well, I'm not the kingdom. He's not the kingdom. We're the kingdom, and I've become a new creature in Jesus. In fact, I'm salt and light in my world. In fact, the nature of God has been dumped onto the table of a world, and I've jumped in the middle of that table and it's the word of God and I've jumped in the middle of that table and the word of God is shaping my life and the nature of God is flowing in my system and I'm literally appearing to be as the visible image of the invisible God so how could I feel hate anger stupid idiot empty headed knucklehead brain dead The only way I could feel that way about you if he does.
And if he doesn't feel that way about you, come on, get this. If he doesn't feel that way about you, and I do, then obviously I'm not. Let me give you another one. Takes us down to verse 27. You have heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. Oh, it's the lust thing. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her or for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I sufficiently handled that one all my life. And you know how I did it? Tore that page out. That satisfied that one, didn't it? What, what are you going to do with that? He's doing two things. He's intensifying and internalizing. Sex is evil. No, it's not. God made man. God made woman. Put them together. And God said, I did good. And I agree. <laughs> well, what happened to this? What happened to a good thing that God made? What went on? It wasn't about a physical activity. It was about what happened to its inside. But then to see the same thing happen in every arena of our life. So you can walk through any of these and come up with the same thing. What happened to us? Well, we became self-centered. We became selfish. See, I want, hey, I want to use everything for myself. See, everything's about me, how I feel, what I want, what I need. Hey! So when you take that and bring it into the whole adultery thing and the lust thing, it isn't about looking at a beautiful woman and saying, my... I have attraction to that. It was never about that. It was never about being attracted to the opposite sex. It was being attracted to the opposite sex for your own selfish ends. That's what it was all about. Come on, the line we used when we were kids, not me, of course, but you know, we, we, we ran out of gas on this, uh, on this uh, dirt road, and, and you know, the moon's shining, no need to waste the time, right? So you wrap your arm around your girl and you say to her, oh, sweetheart, baby, lover, honey bun. You know, I love you. I love you. So come on. Wouldn't it have been, sense, sense, wouldn't it have been something if you'd had sense enough to tell the truth? Try this line. Wrap your arm around your girl and say, hey, baby, I love me. So come on. What? <laughs> that wouldn't work. I know. <laughs> but it would have been the truth. Because to see, if I was filled with the nature of God and I loved you like God loves you, I wouldn't use you. I wouldn't abuse you. I wouldn't, oh, man, I wouldn't risk you. I wouldn't touch you with a 10-foot pole, man. I wouldn't. Well, you can get married and that solves all those problems. No, it doesn't, man. You can use your wife So what we've established in our self-centered carnality is, hey, we got married and I use you and you use me and I use you and you use me and then when you won't use me like I want to, when I can't use you like I want to use you, then, well, I go find somebody else I can use. <coughs> and we're users. That's what he's talking about. He's using each other. So what would happen? Oh, if you were helpless, embraced that, found the overwhelming nature of God filling you, and oh, you became salt and light in your generation, the kingdom of God operating in your generation because the nature of God was dumped on the table of the world and the scriptures, which is the scriptures, and the scriptures are now shaping you and you are literally displaying the very nature of God in your society. What would that do to your whole sexual view of life? You would see women 
as God sees them. You would see women as God sees them. Your perspective of the opposite sex would be as God. Would that be good? So, hey, we preachers, we used to preach against mini skirts and, 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 and on and on it went. And we'll not get into that. On and on it went. And we blame women for this. Yeah, the reason we have a problem is you women. Well, there's a truth to that. But as, hey, what you do to me is not the cause of my hate. How you dress isn't the cause of my lust either. Come on. Because this is about what's in me. And whether I'm in... Come on, people, I, 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 I've got to embrace my helplessness. I've I, I got to get out of the thought process of, well, I'm working my, hey, well, I'm not as bad as I used to be. Oh, you may just be old. I don't know why I brought that up. See, I want to embrace my helplessness. I want to embrace my helplessness. I want to mourn over my helplessness. I want his nature to come, and I want to, oh, please, Jesus, fill me. Go to the depth of my inner heart. Just unite with me. Fuse me with your presence. Until I'm salt and light in my world. Because the nature of God this has dumped itself into the Scriptures and the scriptures are shaping who I am. And my life is literally displaying this, this, this image of the invisible father. Because his nature is in my helplessness. Sermon on the Mount. Oh, Jesus. I, I know good and well I haven't scratched the surface on this. I know good and well I haven't. But every, every cell of my body, every, every pore of my spiritual life, every, every bit of my inner being just cries out that this, this is the answer, God. Embracing my helplessness. And in the name of Jesus, I confess in front of this crowd and before you and all the spiritual angels in heaven and all of the demonic forces of hell, I confess to you, that I am absolutely helpless, unable, cannot, tried, couldn't, strove to attempt and didn't, couldn't pull it off, couldn't get it done, lived in guilt. God, there was no way to do. And I embrace my absolute dependency upon you and would you come and fill me with your nature? Oh, living word of God, cleanse, purify. Hey, it isn't my brother that's got the problem. It isn't what he did to me that's got the pro that where the problem is. The problem is right here in me. I don't have your mind. I don't see people like you see them. My integrity is not yours. That's why I lie. That's why I, come on, I don't have your. Hey, I want it to rain on others, but not on me. I don't have, I don't think like, oh God, you got, could you, could you. Heads are bowed.
How would God take His nature and flow it into the area of difficulty in your life? How would that happen? Well, you ask Him. You ask Him. You don't have to beg Him. You don't have to struggle. You have to receive. Seek. Open up. Oh, what He wants to do in your life. And you can't say, well, God wouldn't do that for me. Might do it for somebody else, but he won't do it for me. Well, then the scriptures is wrong. He doesn't let it rain on the just and on the unjust. Well, I'm too bad or I'm too good. See, none of that plays a part in this because, hey, it's just and unjust and it rains on. Want to seek with us this morning? Moments of seeking.